Then I shall make use of this starship. It will be your chariot! Excuse me. It will carry my power to every corner of creation. Excuse me, I'd just like to ask a question. What does God need with a starship? Bring the ship closer. I said, what does God need with a starship? Do you expect me to talk? And welcome to episode 47 of Do You Expect Us to Talk? I'm your host, Becca, and I am joined, as always, by Dave, Chris, and Charlie. How are you guys doing? Hello! Good evening, folks. <laughs> Happy birthday, Dave. Thank you. It's Dave's birthday today. Happy birthday, Dave. Thanks, I've got the best presents ever. The <laughs> shat. <laughs> but not only the shat, the shat's artistic vision. <laughs> <laughs> the shat at its most shattiness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Starring the chat, directed by the chat from a story idea by from the, the chat. chat. <laughs> Triple whammy. Yes. Three lots of chat. <laughs> and chat can also be uh, described as the quality of this bill. <laughs> <laughs> it really yeah. could. Oh dear. I, I do have to break it to you, listeners, though, that we were discussing fun facts earlier, and we don't think Becca has the weight of Cybox testicles. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I asked her and she just didn't know, which is worrying. <laughs> that poor horse, <laughs> two tons of bollocks. <laughs> so, sorry, <laughs> Buster Gonad. No, I think that's all the introduction we need. Um, so, what do we think of? Who's in it, Becca? Horse? No, I'm laughing too hard. Carry on. <laughs> Okay. William Shatner's in it. We might mention that. <laughs> Leonard Nimoy. DeForest Kelly. Some bloke with massive testicles. He's to be Sean Connery, but isn't. Mm. <laughs> it's directed by The Shad. And released in June 1989. Yeah, the same year as... Uh, well, that was a mega year for blockbusters, wasn't same it? Same year as every other film ever made. <laughs> yeah. What was it? Licence to Kill? Uh... Westerns? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Batman, Jones. Batman, Leaf Weapon 2, um, Indiana what? Jones, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's fair to say this, did this, you know, do you reckon this kind of stood out amongst a summer of sequels and remakes and all the rest of it, or it's, do you think it sank without a trace? I think it stood out as ILM otherwise engaged. <laughs> ILM are busy at the moment, please come back later. <laughs> yeah. So we've got, uh, we've got <laughs> that effects powerhouse Associates and Ferrum. I've never heard of them prior to this film. Mm, there might be a reason for that. They'd have, <laughs> yeah. they'd have struggled to get hired for driving Miss Daisy after this. <laughs> when was when was driving next? Uh, when was uh, driving Miss Daisy? When was that? We asked the tough question so you don't have to. Yeah. Look. Previous year, nineteen eighty eight. That's ah. that's fun, I folks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, yeah. February the twenty third, nineteen ninety. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, as well. Yeah, because I think it. Uh, didn't that beat like Goodfellas? <laughs> it did to the Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> I always remember Mark, 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 Mark Commode saying like, uh, like Driving Miss Daisy wasn't even the best Morgan Freeman film of that week because her glory was out at the same time. So. <laughs> <laughs> but he did some top driving. <laughs> Can't say that for all of his roles. No, not even the one where he played God, but never mind. <laughs> Speaking of which. Speaking of which. They meet. They try to meet God. What do you think of this film, Charlie? Um, I'm quite a fan of it. Um, Yay! I kind of could approach it from two ways. Um, objectively, obviously, the film has a lot of problems. Um, and, and drunk. <laughs> no, that's the other way. You I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but uh, um, but uh, kind of, I really like kind of a lot of the kind of character stuff in here, and the kind of the the ambition behind even if that was not kind of nearly um achieved to what it potentially it might have had but um yeah no i i enjoy it quite a lot and um 
it's uh, it's not the worst Star Trek film for me. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, Charlie. In this, I mean, I I mean, I was I I always remember having a soft spot for this this film, and I know its reputation is kind of really really terrible. Uh, so I was I went into it kind of thinking this might be like a search of spot for me again. It might be like, oh my god, this is, I, I'm not really getting on board with this. But I've got to say, I actually really enjoy my time with it, even though I'm you know it it it's not very good at times. Uh, some of the dialogue is very very poor. Um, some of the special effects are very naff. Like there's one moment where I literally thought of uh, Superman: The Quest for Peace, um, and yeah, and Shatner is at his most um, Shatner-esque, uh, should we say, in his uh, in his performance. But however, there are I, I do like the basic concept. I think there's like there, you know, this is like a really good concept for a Star Trek to to take on, and I like some of the character work. I think um, it has. I know, I know I said this, I have one of my favourite Kurt moments. This actually has two of my favourite Kurt moments. So, for, for whatever it's worth. But, um, no, but I, I, I enjoy my time in this film. I think you know, I think there are, there are good moments in this film, but I can understand why people won't take to it. I think it sags. I think it's, I don't, I don't think it's, it doesn't flow as well as it should. And then there's, there's some weird kind of character stuff, which, uh, between uh, Scotty and Yohura, which I'm like, why is that there? That's just a bit odd. A bit, I don't know. What do you guys think? I think it's going to be, it's definitely going to be down there when we, we start talking about worst Star Trek film for me. I think um, we've got a lot to go through yet. So this is always subject to change. But from the very, very early frames of this film, I've got a problem uh, all the way through with dialogue to the pacing's all over the shop. And it yeah. isn't so much that it, it drags, it's that, some of the best bits of the film are the most fucking irrelevant, which tells you quite a lot about the plot. In the, the first half hours, it's all right, except for what they're saying. I mean, <laughs> the spirit of the opening of the film is really nice, and there's, there's lots about it I really like. And I remember why I thought he was the drunk doctor now. Because every time I saw him, he seemed to be like getting out booze, and he always looks a bit like a drunk Don Knotts at this stage. And, um, yeah, I just thought it was... Um, uh, all the all the way through, they're, they're talking in like cliche after cliche, right tool for the right job, etc. All the way through, the plot's very weak. The effects are terrible. We'll get they, they, we'll get to why there are reasons, but when you look at it, I, yes, it was Earthbound, but the budgets were rising in a pretty sensible fashion. Um, by four, we got to twenty one million. By this one, we're at thirty three million. Whilst it's not the most enormous budget you'll ever see. It, from the, jo- the trajectory of how the budgets were going, it wasn't too bad. But reading into this film, Shatner uh, partly admits he himself did not know how to manage a budget. And also he, he says that the studio didn't um, give him the help he want, he needed. So basically he pissed all his budget away by the time they're about halfway through the film. But he's got some reasonable casting instincts. Um, he certainly It's certainly not embarrassingly directed in terms of shots. The only thing is, Shatner needs someone to rein him in. So Shatner is the worst we've seen him so far in any of these films, and it really becomes apparent about about fifty minutes through the film. He starts he starts becoming the parody Shatner we know. Um, they they all seem dressed up by the boys' brigade, and um, yeah, I didn't have a lot of fun with this. I have to say, but it's not it's not worthless. Um, again, whilst I hate their dialogue. This crew have an easy ambience and an easy way with each other that renders <laughs> renders most of what they do at very least watchable. Yeah, like um, I've, at the beginning, McCoy just looks like he's dressed straight from the seventies with his neckerchief and his and his uh, and he's like double denim and. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, th- I, th- I, th- I th- looking at the chat as well. I think uh, I think wardrobe was arranged by George Lucas and Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> <laughs> the high waisted jeans. They couldn't go up any higher. Yeah. He's he's really determined to show off his rump in this. Um, I must say I, I didn't really believe him. Obviously, you see him first of all is obviously climbing up El Capitan, and yeah. I was like, that's not Get it? El really Capitan. William Shatner, is it? El Capitan, yes. Um, I haven't been up there, but I've been to Yosemite and I've seen it. Um, but yeah, I was like, who is that? And it's like it's not Shatner clearly, and it is. I thought, oh Jesus. Did anyone else see Cliffhanger when they watched it? Because I did. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got to see that film. You really don't. <laughs> 
Did you, anyone else do better? Cliffhanger? Well, obviously, the Shat is a, is a marvel of, of uh, bodily construction. Um, <laughs> I, I imagine he spent, you know, Stallone-esque amounts of time well, in the gym preparing. I, I suppose you could think Mission Impossible 2, you know, when he's climbing That's that big, thinking. yeah. But it's like, you know, just like freestyling, not without any safety notes or anything. We're invoking all the greats here. Yes, <laughs> we are. Um, <laughs> fucking hell. Becca, what did you think? That just sounds so far of you, you know. Yeah, fucking hell. Good night. <laughs> yeah, mixed feelings, really. I mean, same as my favourite Bond movie ever, Dine of the Day. It's like the first 45, 50 minutes are, are fine. Then it all goes horribly downhill from there, really. Um Visual effects quite poor, or they probably groundbreaking for the time. Um, they really were. <laughs> I'm sure they were. Yeah, fuck all that Star Trek, Star Wars bollocks from ten years before. No, um, yeah, sort of cliched script really. Um, I agree with you, Chris, on the um, the weird thing between Scotty and your hero. It's like, no, oh, what's going on there? Um, and when you sort of... and when you want to get a really male environment like turned on, <laughs> <laughs> it's very odd. Very odd. Um, a couple of the moments are a bit strange. Well, I mean, we could have just sent out Scotty to do that. The effect would have been much the same. It would have been a lot easier. <laughs> um, but well, I think one positive is that um, uh, Chekhov kind of gets an easy ride throughout this film. He doesn't have a lot happen to him. Well, he normally um, gets the shit kicked out of him. He, does, he, he gets, survives. He has it easy in this film. He gets a bit lost to studio towards the beginning, and obviously yeah. he's. You know, hops in for the captain, and it's like, well, how lame was that? By the way, it's like, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> the way he's blowing on the communicator, saying, oh, there's a wind. There's, oh, that's 70 degrees and sunny. He's like, oh. <laughs> we lost it. Never live it yeah. there. That ship you're on, where you can tell how many people are on a planet, and when, <laughs> you know, and when they last had a bowel movement from tens of thousands <laughs> of miles away, might know what weather you're in. Can, can, can anyone actually explain what the point of that scene was, anyway? Cause, There's like... no point to any of the other <laughs> stuff, really. I mean, That's like... what I'm saying. It's all irrelevant, but like, it's some of the better parts of the film. Yeah, they're, they're more enjoyable. They don't actually add anything to the plot or anything like that, but they're actually quite funny. I mean, I think some. I, I'm a really sucker. I'm a sucker for like a really stupid, you know, cheesy lines, things like that. So you know, things like "Oh, not in front of the Klingons" near the end. That really made me laugh. Um, yeah, that's that's a good line. And it's just, just very cheesy, very bad. But yeah, things like, oh, you'll, you'll never live it down. And obviously, I just think it's hilarious. But yeah, things like that are kind of, they didn't add anything, but I think they're quite funny and they serve as some of the film's more memorable moments, which just goes to show that the book of this film is quite so, funny. Yeah, I, unlike, and it didn't engage me very much, to be honest. Unlike some of the films in this series, it, it's at its best before it actually kicks into gear. Yeah, and definitely. once it kicks into gear, it's like, oh. Uh. Mm, downhill from here. Well, what do we think of Psylocke um, as a character and uh, as a performance? Um, I, I forget the actor's name because I don't think he's been in a lot. Lawrence of something or other. Yeah, Sh- the Shat Boy Montelli. <laughs> not, 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 <laughs> not, Sean Connery. Connery. <laughs> yeah, not Sean Connery. Yeah, Lawrence looking Bill, There we are. So, yeah, Sean, I, Sean Connery was offered the role first, uh, uh, but um, I did read that it was literally the competing schedule with. Um, Indiana Jones. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the right film won there. So good choice. Yeah. So Sean. They, they sh- should have mailed it to the master. But we could have got Roger Moore as Indiana Jones Senior. <laughs> it's got to be worth a shot. <laughs> That's an alternate film that I would have liked to see. I would I pay. Mean, I would pay good it? money to see that. If if they'd have gone to Roger Moore for this instead of Sean Connery, <laughs> so and who, basically who got... we're told he's taken a load of like people hostage. You would immediately think, like, you know, sex crimes and Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> Sorry, we thought it would be quite like Okay, um, so where were we? Uh, you asked what we thought of Cyborg, and I went on about Roger Moore in Sex Offending. Yes. <gasps> <laughs> well, 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 we all know he would have had uh, fun with the, uh, the free-titted uh, cat lady. We're never going to get him on the show now. <laughs> What? what we were in with a really good shot <laughs> seven weeks we never know. slagging him off we nearly had Robert Darby but never mind how uh, do we nearly have Robert Darby very nearly very nearly you wrote to him and he ignored you <laughs> yeah. So, yeah so so what do you think of uh, Cyborg then was he one Spock of the best? Spock has a half brother <gasps> who knew he might, he might win least convincing laugh ever just yeah, before he goes weird. to the credits where he's like ah, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> he goes oh, um, this is quite a funny joke to potentially evil villain you think hmm okay but yeah he's, he's not very convincing I don't think um, well I'll just call him not Sean Connery throughout this film unfortunately um, 
yeah, it didn't kind of really register with me. I didn't find it very con- convincing performance-wise at all. I think Sean Connery would have been dreadful in this. It's just too much because um, it would have been Sean Connery. Yeah, so you have like, Shat just... and Sean Connery. Jesus. But just, just the fact that he is Sean Connery. And it worked in Indiana Jones because you've got the subtext there of him being James Bond and Indiana Jones kind of being a, a, a kind of successor of James Bond anyway. And they also, sure. um, Charlie, they also gave him a character to disappear into. In, exactly. Not that he really disappears into characters, but certainly there was, a, there were things about, there were, there were things for him to play, whereas this would have been Sean Connery in a robe. Plus also with um, with Last Crusade, um, he also, Sean Connery's got a house and floor to play off, so... Uh, also, with uh, Last Crusade, you also got um, the chemistry between Harrison Ford that really sort of like bounces off the screen, really. So that helps that performance along as well. So you also got that added value. You wouldn't have had that in in this as well. So it would have been like the you know, just, it just would have been like that film where he played a monk or something. <laughs> yeah. um, well, it's, 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 a, it's a much more serious role. Whereas, as much as I love Last Crusade, he is basically mugging you through the whole film. It's all comic shine in this. This isn't. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm kind of with Charlie. I think he does okay. You know, Cyborg's not a great character in not a great film, but it's not an embarrassment. It's just purely, uh, it's not kind of imposing enough for me. And now he's not meant to be a black hat villain, but at the same time, it's it comes off a bit confused, old man. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I do. I do actually like him as a character. I like the print, oh, the whole uh, thing. That it's not actually. A proper villain. Well, it kind of is with kind of with quotation marks. God, uh, but you know he is essentially the villain, but he's not really that sort of that character. I like how it's just it's just like a story of itself, really. I, I think he's, I think he has some screen presence, and I think it it kind of carries the carries the role. You know, I I I, I did wonder whether. I bought him as a Vulcan or not, but then uh, it's like it's not really like like Spock in any way. It's just like he's just a, a guy with a beard with pointy ears. But then again, there is the whole thing with him being like the ignoring whole logic side of it. So I guess that counteracts that argument. But as a non Star Trek fan, I don't know how true to, that would be really. Um, but yeah, anyway, I, I kind of like Sarlacc, you know. Yeah, you know, but obviously I'm alone in that. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's not Sean Connery, as far as I'm concerned. Um, no, it's okay. I, th- I think. Well, um, <laughs> it's a controversial view. Controversial. No, no, no. As compared to not Kirstie Alley. Um, no, I think there's, there's quite an interesting. Get angry letters now. Oh dear, fan club alert. Um, no, there's an interesting duality with with this character though. I think you kind of, yeah, as I say, you, you don't know who he, well, you know who he is, but you don't quite know his true intentions. Obviously, he's, he's looking for something. He's on on some kind of mission. He's recruiting followers. So you think, hmm, some kind of you know cult leader. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not as clear cut, and there's kind of lots of different layers to his character. But um, yeah, I kind of agree with you. It's kind of a not amazing character and a not amazing film. Um, but, you know, it, it does its best with the role, and I think it's you know it's quite an interesting multi layered role. Um, yeah. But it's just like not. I didn't find it very convincing towards the end. Um, I felt that kind of the way that he sort of comes to an end is a little bit like, oh. um, it's like a, a great big you know it happens to a great big moment, but just a bit of a you know sort of puff of smoke as it were. I mean, the the plot itself is pretty thin. I'm not, yeah, I must admit. I mean, it, there isn't more, a lot to it, really. I mean, do you know what? I, I'm not sure we can hold this off any longer. Let's Shall we discuss it. this film sequentially? sequentially. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I suppose. I so, think we can do a better job than they did. Okay, well, <laughs> let, let's start with a positive. The Paramount logo, fucking good work, nicely done. <laughs> like the, the white on black credits as well. That's, they stand out so. Well, we don't get the credits first, do we? Yeah. we get... No, we don't. And, you know, now, is it just me, or is like the very opening shot uh, look really, really good? It's, it looks like it's really promising at first. Looks good till his horse arrives. In that, when he arrives on the horse, suddenly you got some really weird dust effects that aren't very good. But they look a bit grainy. As it's riding yeah, mm. along, yeah, it's really good. Um, I didn't know Nimbus Three is where they shot the Mad Max films. It does look exactly the same, doesn't it? It is a bit. Actually, it's it's more Fury Road than any of the others. Yeah, it's um, like the Harvey Desert or something like that. I think, isn't it? I don't know where they shot that. Actually, no, I need to look it up. But then you got the uh, the guy from um, the Hills of Eyes. You know the 
that that fella oh, keeps. Yeah. yeah. I thought he looked familiar. Yeah. Him with the gums. Um, <laughs> Him with the three teeth. Yeah, and with his little rocket uh, gun. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there weren't any weapons on the planet of Galactic Police, you know. Apparently, yeah, apparently so, yeah. Apparently um, so. Like, I, 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 do like, I do like the scene in terms of how it looks. The, 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 I mean, alarm bells rang with the dialogue. The dialogue just didn't throw. Um, and I forget how what Silock actually says in regards to, like, let me share your pain. He uh, says he says all beings, I think he says. I can't remember the exact dialogue, but the gist is all beings have, like, a defining pain. Yeah. Which, as a concept, we've never even encountered. I think we all understand the, po- the impact of pain from the past. No one's arguing with that. But as, as a central concept to how he's going to get his plan to work, I thought that was delivered in the most ridiculous throwaway fashion. Um, humor, yeah, people have uh, this defining pain. All oh, right, brilliant. And that's it. And? <laughs> we just buy into that. <laughs> no explanation. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah. It, it, I think it's just badly dialogue. I mean, it's just, it doesn't flow nicely at all. It's like, and, and, and let me learn from it. And it, it, mm. it just doesn't sort of, now, can you rewrite that, please? It just doesn't. It, sort it of... needed to. I thought it needed to be the second person he encountered, if you like. Yeah. You see him get the win this guy over. It's all a bit mystical, and then in a slower post-credit sequence, explain else. the thinking behind that. Yeah. Rather than him going, ah, oh, we've all got this one defining pain. Let me show you. See, right, brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> On next, <laughs> um, was wasn't there? Um... Like a writer strike or some difficulty during the making of this film as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was a. Uh, yeah, there, the appeared right set, <laughs> there appeared to be a set builder strike as well because they do walk down the sort of uh, corridors of the Enterprise D at some point. <laughs> Enterprise D. <laughs> yeah, um, they're definitely using bits of next gen- next generation set here as well. Um, yeah, there is a writer strike. There was a writer strike kind of autumn-ish of 1987, I believe. But of course, when you think of the lead times of these things, it, it would have affected the amount of drafts they could do. Sure. Um, originally, there were all sorts of different ideas Shatner came up with for this film, including Fountain of Youth and all this kind of stuff. He had um, what's known as a favoured, or what they knew as a favoured nations clause. Oh, right. uh, when they were doing their when they did their deals in the 60s with Paramount well with Paramount eventually I guess NBC I'm getting confused on time frames there actually because it is described as their 60s deals with Paramount and that doesn't ring true okay but at some point when they negotiated the deal that Shatner and Nimoy had were that if one got something the other had the right to something so it just meant that they, their salaries wouldn't go out of whack too much, etc. So when um, Nimoy got the chance to direct, that basically unlocked the same opportunity for Shatner. He um, they get he consented to letting Nimoy do four as well on the basis that he could do the next one. So he had the right to not only direct this but develop the script as well and the story. And I'm not sure he was the right choice. Having said that, his choice of shots isn't isn't bad at all. I do like some of his um, direction in this film. I think some of the shots, that, the shot choices that he makes, um, are really impressive. Um, and I sort of they they look well in terms of like with the, with the look of the film. And yeah, I, I do quite admire some aspects of his direction here in this film. He says himself that he was trying to um, get the camera to do things it couldn't really do, and things mm-hmm. like that. And Harv Bennett made quite a quite a cutting remark about how first time directors always try and like innovate within the craft mm. I. They just too, come, too ambitious you know, he said like, he'd come up with yeah. something and, it, and he said he would talk as though he'd invented the wheel um, but the end result is what you have on screen and at least technically when I compare it to some films I've seen in my life where I thought what the fuck is the camera doing there for example there's none of that in this film. It, it's competently directed, and most people report, with the exception of James Dewan, who really hates Shatner, most of them report having a reasonable time working for him. 
Yeah, especially somebody like George Takei as well, who famously didn't get on so much. George yeah. Takei's not quoted in anything I've read on this film, but certainly like Walter Koenig, for example, who doesn't yes. really like Shatter, Shatner and is very much, he's all about himself was very yeah. positive because he went on to set thinking Shatner made some comments about wanting to redefine elements of the characters and that got everyone's backs up. He said he had eight days on set or whatever it was and he said he was nothing but a gentleman, really kind and there was a very fun atmosphere there. Okay, but on, exactly, the, yeah. on the other hand, you got James Doohan saying, I normally did things in one take, that thing where I banged my head, that was 35 takes. It just, I just couldn't work with him. It was Takei's autobiography where he uh, said that he had a... Um a good time on the uh, being directed by Shatner, despite obviously the history yeah. of what yeah. was going on. So what, what was it? Was just Shatner was just created a fun atmosphere to work with then? Or was he just That's like, the relaxed? way it's described. He was a gentleman. Uh, he was under a lot of pressure because they had an extraordinarily tight time frame to make it and money was an issue all the way through. And Shatner freely admits, when you get Shatner sensibly on a topic, uh, he does talk quite intelligently about these things. Mm. And, and he says that, you know, he, he mismanaged his budget. He, he um, mismanaged is probably too, too, the wrong word. But he, front, he certainly front-loaded it. And by the time you look at it, it's towards the end of the film. It, he's got no money left to do what he wants to do. Having said that, I've read some of the ideas of what he wanted to do, and they would have been awful. So in some respects, it's kind of worked out for the best. But people report him being fun to work for, um, very, very polite, very complimentary of people's performances. Nobody really, with the exception of, as I say, of um, James Doohan, say anything negative about him. And that speaks volumes. If if, if Charlie's seen George Takei say, saying positive things, yeah. well, that then I think we've got to take it as read that it was a pretty decent set. But there were concerns about the script. Was that just because of, like, James Doohan had to, like, bang his head against the thing for eight times? He just didn't, he didn't like William Shatner. Oh, did he? Not? never liked William Shatner. Oh, right. no. so, so, what, so, I mean, forgive me if this has already been discussed, you know, um, but why... Do some of the cast not like Shatner? Well, I'll give you my take and then I'll let you give Charlie give his because we've read different things on it. But the gist of it is when they were on the original series, um, it was very loaded towards the main three. And of those three, certainly the main two. You watch most episodes of Star Trek. There's no equivalent of the next generation where you get like a Troy episode. Yeah, There isn't a really a Sulu episode and so on. But what would happen is the supporting characters would have like a line or a shot. They would have something in the script that they could go, brilliant, that's something for me in this episode. And the next thing you know, Shatner's in the ear of whoever the director is that week. And suddenly the, sh the line is now Shatner's. Um, yeah. Or the camera angle gets changed and all of a sudden Nichelle Nichols or whoever isn't in shot anymore. So it was it was almost kind of like a blind, envy kind of like a, it was a blind ego thing the way it's told. No one ever says Shatner was a particularly a pig. He was just entirely self-centered, self-absorbed and all about William Shatner on yeah. the TV show anyway. What have you read about the whole thing with that? Um, yeah, pr Charlie? pretty much the same thing that he was kind of it was his ego um, that uh, that really kind of upset people. And uh, it wasn't just, it wasn't necessarily him being any kind of a nasty person or anything like that. It was just literally his ego from being the, uh, the, the star of the show. The closest I've read to anything about him being nasty, and even then it's not nasty, it's more, it's just a lack of common decency in some respects, is that there was, a, a, it was kind of implied in the book he wasn't overly welcome to Kirst, welcoming to Kirstie Alley on Star Trek 2, where the rest of them tried to make her feel at home, because it's quite intimidating walking mm -hmm. in where it's a crew that have been together for so many years, yeah. in one form or another, and they and, and the words was, well, everyone was really welcoming but they, and they said, well, not Bill, but Bill is Bill, but that's the closest I've read to anything nasty it's just, everything is very much about him. It, it's just, I mean like, it, it's, it's difficult to think that, like, he would be an arse because, like, I you see him how he is now, and he's kind of, kind of uh, lie back and a little bit eccentric. Uh, but he, he doesn't seem to kind of carry any, uh, like, like, not not much ego with him at all. He doesn't seem to be very like uh, 
like I'm Bill Shatner. He seems he might just because he's now he's older now he's just contempt of like with his career now. He's like you know what, I'm Captain Kirk. I did all right, didn't I? And he's just kind of happy with what he's got. And now he's just you know he likes doing the Star Trek conventions, which which before he kind of didn't. So may it might be down to that, but I just I I can't see the kind of the. The, the guy with the big ego kind of pissing everyone off. An awful lot of it was, what's the word, ignorance more than anything else. Yeah. In that I, he, just, I do he, remember, he just wasn't aware that he was pissing I, I people off. I do remember reading many years ago, he did two, he did Star Trek Memories and Star Trek Movie Memories. It was like a, uh, two volumes and exactly what the title suggests. One was his memories of working on the TV series, one was his memories of working on the films. And he does, and I can't remember the exact detail... But the gist was, he asked Nichelle Nichols what the problem was, and she said, you. And he was really taken aback, and he listened, to, by his own account, to be fair. He listened very patiently to what she had to say. Shatner went through this whole, the whole certainly the TV show, not really understanding why people didn't like him. So, yeah, you can imagine that would be almost like building the war if he doesn't understand what the fuck he's doing wrong. Or what you know, it's like, well, what's their problem? <laughs> so, yeah, and of course, the people he was closest to um, were the were the other main two, DeForest yeah. Kelly and Leonard Nimoy, and they had nothing but the highest respect for each other, all of them. But it is difficult when you're a, a Jimmy Doohan or something, and you've got a microscopic role as it is, and yet you're locked into contracts, which mean you can't go and do other work, and you finally get a decent line or scene to showcase your talents you see Shatner disappear into a room with the director and all of a sudden you don't have that line or shot anymore yeah it's got to be very difficult yeah you, you can imagine you can imagine but so I, I honestly thought I was going to read a lot of stories of, of open rebellion on this on this mm. particularly as the end result is at very best controversial in how people view its quality um, but no the, uh, people speak highly of working with and for him and he was a very attentive director, determined to... you got to think, I mean, William Shatner can, has done skydiving, rock climbing, horse riding, directing, acting. He's written books. Shatner must have a willingness there somewhere to he, learn. He's done music. To learn. He's done some wonderful <laughs> He's released music. an album. He's done um, more than that. What I, lo- what I loved is when, um, when he did... Um, Par- I think he did Paranoid by Black Sabbath. But I swear blind... He just puts it on, playing in the background and kind of vaguely <laughs> talks over it. Um, but the fact is, he must have a have discipline. You, have you all heard his common least, people? Uh, yeah. Come. And he's either, I think he might be Juilliard trained as well. He's classically trained anyway, Shatner, whatever you think really? of Really? So there must be an element there of he is capable of learning a discipline and a craft. And the impression I got in this film was, yes, he was overambitious and his ideas were a bit over-operatic, to say the least. But he was he was trying to do it right. And he was trying to be good for his crew and his cast. And people largely suggest he succeeded. Yeah. I mean, you can say, I mean, at least he, like, I think we all agree there are there is a good concept here. Oh, definitely. Ground, you know. So it might be a fail film, but it's, as I say, it's not like a oh, it's it's complete smouldering. So there is like a good like idea at the heart of it that you think, okay, well, you know, if only this could have been better. I often think like if this this film was like a regular forty forty five minute Star Trek episode, it probably would fare a lot better because the plot is is pretty thin. You'd probably cut out a lot of the crap, and you you can probably sort of have like a more concise story there would you guys agree or yeah it's it's funny because gene rodham had a fit over it because of it including yeah because of it including god and being kind of every <laughs> talking about religion and something he you know his his thing where he thinks oh religion is not going to exist in the future and all this rubbish um despite the fact that when they were still doing the uh, before the major picture when they're trying to do films he create he wrote a similar thing um, about a uh, the, the Enterprise crew and, and God. Um, I mean, I think it's a really interesting idea, and um, yeah, it's something that, that religion again is is an interesting concept in sci-fi, and uh, was tackled really well in Deep Space Nine. 
um, and it has, is there to be looked at. Um, and I think so, Shatner's kind of original ideas sound interesting, um, a little bit kind of Dante's Inferno, which is always, always fun, um, but with kind of the religious nature of all, it was never, nothing that Paramount were ever going to really um, bankroll at that point or that kind of intensity, so which is why it kind of ended up more of something a bit more kind of parody, I mean, of the kind of televangelist, which at the time, I mean, you think of License to Kill, it's exactly yeah. the same. Um, License to Kill has got, you've got um, Deanna Troy in Next Generation, which had started two years before this, and the whole psychiatrist on a ship thing, ship's counsellor. So the 80s were very much that kind of thing of, um, getting in touch with your feelings exactly yeah mm. exactly yes yeah. so I mean it, it may be something that potentially was looked to have more re- resonated there than it does now but I think yeah I, I think it, it's this with some kind of mitigating factors I think mainly was the fact that the, there was the writer's strike and they needed a, a better script and probably a better writer to be honest with you but they didn't have that time and it was pushed into production and again because I think because of the voyage home and how, what a success that was. There was perhaps a, a, a pressure to make this one kind of similar in the kind of comedy vein. But because The Voyage Home, everything in that, the comedy in that was predilected on them being in the fish out of water tale. Whereas here, if this was just normal Star Trek. It, it didn't work um, half as well as, as they intended. And I, I still think it was quite a funny film. And I enjoy a lot of the humour. And again, the camaraderie. Of the uh, of of the crew and particularly uh, those three, um, like no. in that campfire scene at the beginning for some yeah. when he, when McCoy has a go at Spock, um, for uh, for trying to contemplate the meaning of row 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 your boat instead of singing it. Yeah, is, uh, well, that's, is always that's, fun. Our, that's our first scene after the credits. Um, yeah, the credits have what will. It- start to be known by this point as the next generation music. We know it's for the motion picture, but obviously yeah. obviously, with some of the things in this film, it probably wasn't the best time to reuse it. Uh, but we do come out with, um, you know, um, Kirk Rock climbing and that whole thing with the boots and then round a campfire. What do we, I found all this stuff entertaining, provided I didn't concentrate too much on what they were saying. <laughs> I, I I just I just go that that sort of back special effect when like uh, Kirk is falling off the cliff. And, like, yeah. yeah, terrible. It is. It, it, I mean, really, he should have he should have grabbed a plane halfway down and pulled himself in and flown it off. Well, yeah, I was I was thinking Superman four like completely like it was, it was <laughs> that. What were, what what where he catches Lois? Yeah, or just or, or, or just anything any any spe- special effect on that good. film. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it it wasn't good, but then you know, but then you know, as Charlie said, you got like sort of the charm of the community. I mean, the the the, the, um, the bit that always gets me is like in the middle of the film where McCoy uh, like offers to offers to hold Spock down while <laughs> when McCoy <laughs> suggests like sort of oh, I, I should I should hit you or something. Now that 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 got me love, but um, but yeah, I mean that there is a certain charm how like they keep going like row 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 your boat. <laughs> There's a charm, but it's <laughs> utterly fucking pointless. Yeah, it? it's a bit useless. Yeah, it's kind of it's it's not it's got potential, but it isn't fully realised. It's like mm. I don't th- I don't think it's useless because I think it's just it is there just to kind of establish again these these three because the because the the point in the film where um, because these these three are such an such an important part of of Star Trek that there's the point where these three are uh, being taken apart or tried to take apart by Cyborg on the whole thing about Kirk saying I'll die alone but he's not alone because these two are always around him and I think that's the kind of thing that that, um, that kind of emphasises and that's why I, I really like these scenes I just respectfully just disagree in as much as I just think it's I think it's really ham-fisted I mean we've we've just been introduced to Oh, we've all got this one pain, by the way. Oh, all right, cool. And then we've got, I'll, I've always known I'll die alone, which, spoiler alert, he fucking doesn't. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> when it comes to it. And it's all a bit weird. And it doesn't strike me as the fifth film, only a couple of years after the previous one, about two and a half years after the last one. In that 
it's almost got the structure of a first film. If it hadn't been, if it hadn't been, if it hadn't been Uhura picking them up and just saying, um, you know, we've got orders, away we go. But say they were doing that, catching up as old friends, and they were suddenly drafted back to Starfleet. It would be like a first film. It takes about 32 minutes to get to the story, and the film's only an hour and three quarters. It has its charm. It ha- you know, I mean, we get into the Enterprise, and it, obviously it's a no and new shit, but things aren't working quite right. It's a little bit like the teleport isn't working. So, and and so, which is kind of odd thing. It's like the, the there's only like one once the you, know, you see people teleport. I'm just glad. Starfleet don't run like a car dealership. <laughs> you go to pick your new car up and, f- you know, the brakes don't work, but don't worry, we'll sort them out next week. <laughs> 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 or you can spend two years fixing this thing we've just given you. <laughs> um, so that was all. That's a bit. The whole thing is just like, we see that again and again, though. We'll see it in, um, we'll see it in, um, in, uh, in Generations. Uh, we saw it. We saw it to a degree in some of the earlier films as well, but certainly in Generations with the Enterprise B, you know, they go out completely not ready to do anything. So it, it's not the. It's not the. Uh, it, it's not unprecedented. Um, and it's okay, but I just look at the running time and think, well, basically, you ended up with what was about an episode's length. Once you actually got past what was a very long preamble. Albeit yeah, very good. I think yeah, definitely. I, I think that's why it feels very short. Well, it is very short because once you had all the setup, like there isn't much plot because once they go, I mean, what once once they get on the ship, they go straight to uh, you know Paradise City, <laughs> and uh, where the grass is green. Yeah, and the girls are, <laughs> and and the girls are like cats and have free tits. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, and uh, and they, they meet Cyborg. What did they evolve from? Cats know. have like six nipples. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but apparently they die once they hit water. <laughs> yeah, that, that scene, I was just like, what? So she's drowned already? Obviously, cats don't like water, but that was a step too far to have a drown on the pool table. It's like, what the hell's going on there? <laughs> I don't know. Very odd, very odd. But obviously, I don't know. They didn't. Ah. Uh, there's a couple of the scenes which quite upset me, and that's one of them. I, I, I did notice a lot of lens flare, which I thought, oh, is this where Je- uh, Abram's got his... DJ, yeah, <laughs> DJ's got the idea from Billy lens flare. He thought, I need to learn from the master. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, for everything I've just said, this first half an hour is really entertaining. It's quite good fun, but they didn't really learn much from, like, last last week, um, with the previous film. Um, it was more kind of like... Um, it, the, the plot's quite thin. They have to save the whales in order to save the humans. Um, but that, that's fine. That zips along. You know, I didn't find parts of it kind of drag as much. Whereas this time, there are pockets of it that could be improved. But yeah, yeah apart from that, I say so. So far, everything's fine. Very entertaining. Um, just it goes slowly downhill. <sighs> yeah. What happens next? <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, they, they get yeah, to, the, um, yeah, the outpost, which obviously, well, yeah, that's, I think it's just basically, they've obviously seen Star Wars and they've been like, right, okay, this is the, uh, the cantina, isn't it? Um, Sarek basically takes over Paradise City, doesn't he? Yeah, uh, he turns and, up. And he gets, so. like, yeah, and his whole plan is he gets, like, the, like, the, the, the those three ambassadors, so uh, the, uh, and the uh, Federation will send a starship to come rescue yeah. him and he'll get a, get a starship and go over to God Planet. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's gold planet, isn't it? God, the universe, God's the planet. galaxy's quite small, isn't it? It's well, it's to the, the center of the galaxy. I mean, like Voyager would have taken seventy-five years to get home from where they, they get were there instantly. And they most they get they there in time. a couple of days. They have time to change the outfits <gasps> on the way. So, I like the bit where they're kind of. Um, I think it's obviously just after they they're told, "Oh, it sure leaves up," and it's just like, "Oh." You know, good night, Spock. Good night, Bones. Like, good night, John Boy. You know, yeah. <laughs> and that was like you got a blazing saddles vibe there as well. I think, which is which is good fun. Oh, they didn't fall. Yeah, with the beans, exactly. I know. I think we're skipping ahead a few scenes, but that just is the two things. They would have been great if they did, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> these are like any other beans you've eaten before, Spock. What was the secret ingredient? <laughs> 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 Raspberry right. in listeners' ears there. Sorry about that. 
I, I'm, I'm just picturing, like, of, of the scene where they're all farting. I'm thinking the, sh the shat shat himself. That's what I'm thinking of. I followed who? <laughs> hey. <laughs> this, is, this is quality cutting edge audio entertainment, folks. Uh... I think we've probably plumbed into new depth. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Well, I've forgotten how people let's carry on. So, Charlie, did Chatner shit himself? Disgust. <laughs> Not as far as I know. <laughs> no, come on, okay, let's let's be a bit serious now. Come on. <laughs> so, um, what does happen next? Uh, well, we we do we do find that the uh, he he basically because uh, there's a Romulan, a Klingon, and a human, uh, effectively ambassador to to this place, isn't there? To Nimbus Three, mm. and so that draws in certainly the Klingons. And they've asked for a, a starship, and the guy on the Klingon ship really just wants... He's like a boy who wants to take a scalp, prove his warrior credentials. Yeah. He's very likely to go after Kirk once they get there. And the setup's quite nice, you know. I do think the Klingon effects look really odd, because uh, we've already got Next Gen on screen at this point. So the head effects, look, you know, the makeup looks really strange, but... I think they they kind of underused uh, they kind of underused the ambassadors a bit. I think. Yeah, but they kind of have no purpose in the story other than the fact that they're just there to, for as part of, part of a uh, Psylocke's plan, and that's it. They just kind of hang around. Yeah, I, gu I guess they are. I mean, the basic setup, Charlie. What would you say? I mean, the basic setup is quite promising. Yeah, and uh, it's quite quite interesting. Yeah, the way they get the um, the Klingons involved. Um, See the uh, too much, not enough budget budget for the Romulans. Um, no, I was no, wondering that. How much money we got for Rias? We could afford four. Oh well, <laughs> four, just and four. I, sp I suppose it follows on from um, the really angry dude and Klingon guy in Star Trek Four. Um, the uh, the Klingon, there's probably a certain section of Klingons that are really pissed off at Kirk. Yeah, like and the, and the usual warmongering ones. So yeah, and considering he's like the most famous to them, I imagine, especially probably because of what happened in Star Trek Three. Yeah, um, that uh, yeah, like you said, he's he's a scalp for someone who uh, wants to uh, wants wants to get power. Um, yeah, I mean, we so, basically yeah, so that's, that's, it, it, they are a warrior race. That's very much established by this point. Yeah. It adds just another element of threat to it. Is like you know, not only have they got like deal with Psylocke and and do whatever he he wants to do, they've also got like the Klingons on the tail, you know, trying to hunt hunt down Kirk. So it just adds like another element of like threat to the film. Yeah, I see. I only watched this a couple of hours ago, and you're making it sound much better than I remember. Well, you see, <laughs> it's like Kirk kind of selling me on this. <laughs> <laughs> But we'll be loving it by the end. Like, yeah, that was yeah, amazing. End, yeah, so my opening spiel was one of the worst films in the series. So sum up, Dave, love it. Really great. <laughs> <laughs> Best film ever. Yeah. Um, I'm an idiot that couldn't like this. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I stick to my guns briefly. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there is plenty not to like about it, though, really. But... Uh... <laughs> I stand by everything I said, actually, but it isn't it isn't worthless, uh, really. No. And I think it's very easy to look at the effects and just and, and you have to judge the effects because it is part of the it is part of the you know the, the overall film. It is you know it is it is fair game to say it damages the film, but at the same time, the score's really good. I still really I think ever um, you know lifts the film up to a high degree. It adds like a certain and like a nice sort of extra sheen of quality to to watching it. I, I feel. Charlie, who was it? Was this Jerry Goldsmith? Jerry Goldsmith, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was nice to hear the Klingon theme back again. Mm. Uh, particularly. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's the, the score is amazing and far better than the film, really. And um, yeah, like Chris said, I think it really kind of really helps the film. And uh, there's some really kind of excellent moments where it's just the score doing all the work. Um, like when they kind of when they pack up after going camping and return to the Enterprise, and it's kind of a big kind of swell of the Star Trek theme, and that's all really nice. Yeah. I agree with you, though. I think the score does 
elevate it um, above, really above and beyond, I think. So, yeah, I agree. So where do we go after that? This is where I start struggling. And I, and I, I did notice my things would happen and I'd have to go back a bit and just watch it again. I was struggling to keep my concentration going. It was starting to flag. And Shatner's performance was starting to get bigger. They sent me the, uh, the CCTV footage of a yeah. uh, cyborg, and that's where kind of Spock kind of proves us in that maybe there's something uh, something going on there. Um, he saw twigs, didn't he? He's like, hmm. Yeah. He got the idea that they're related somehow, but we don't quite know how. Well, we don't even know related, but certainly the past. Well, no, but you know, I mean, yeah. there's a kind and, of and this time, them. Spock isn't hiding it. It's not like motion picture where you think, "What a Spock's intention?" Because it is. You look like you've seen a ghost, and I think I may have done. You know, yeah. I'm sure I know it's, this it's guy. Obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's more overt this time. So, um, and um, then they uh, get ready to rescue the hostages. And uh, yeah, the, the, there's some fighting. Dancing. Yeah, and dancing. Oh, God. Yeah, oh, oh God. The, the dance they thing. should have combined yeah. the two to get 10 minutes off the running time, which should have oh, been You know what? I'm surprised I, I, I'm, I'm surprised I blanked that from my mind. Yeah, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is the, the, the one irredeemable thing in the film for me. Is really? That scene <laughs> is just, the, just the, everything from concept down to execution. Is that where um, Sunita got the idea from? I don't know who did it first. <laughs> Is it you or Sunita? I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, it's, it, it, it just strikes me as something that's just a bit naff and just like, oh, come on, really? And like, sexist as well. It's very sexist. Yeah, I, I don't approve. Um, although, to be fair, she, well, it's really bad because I feel bad for you because she doesn't get much to do um, like, over the last couple of films. I've got her to do that. Exactly, exactly. It's just like a real... Well, the she would have been, well, Nichelle Nichols, I, please correct me if I get this wrong. I got a feeling without looking, Nichelle Nichols was about 37 years old when the series start, started. I might have that oh, wrong, yeah. maybe she was 30. So if we're 23 years on, I think that's humiliating. I'm not saying 60-year-old women can't be attractive, sexy, or whatever else, but I kind of think this is a bit humiliating. I just think it's lame. It's just like, you know... I, it's I, a poor excuse, and yeah, I, very... I won't, I, won't go, not I won't go as far as say it's sexist myself, but I just think it's just a bit inspired. It's like if you were trying to think, oh, let's think of distraction, you think, oh, about this, go, God, have you got anything else? Have you got like a, a better idea? And plus, also, it's like, come on, how old is she? Like, let's have a bit of decency, you know? I think the argument that it's sexist would actually be quite possibly. It, 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 on both sides. Firstly, it, it's the idea that like they're only useful for like what they can do physically, a yeah. woman. Yeah. But it's yeah. also, but it's also looking at it from the other perspective that like men are that fucking dumb that that's yeah. all you got to yeah. do. So neither way round, I think no one comes out of it with any mass massive credit. To be honest, I mean, so it's a sort that's of thing. It's a sort of idea that's been done to death anyway. It's just like oh, really we've seen it at, like a gazillion times before. Uh, yeah, yes. and it's frankly, just like... the living daylights had the ultimate. <laughs> <laughs> Once you've done that, you can't beat that. Lost you can't go back. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I just I you can't, you can't best to perfection, can you? No, but, no, but, you but, <laughs> we've just we've just picked up on it on every level. It, it, it's sexist, um, you know. It's that idea that women are just their physicality. It's a little bit humiliating for a sixty-year-old woman when you can't be bothered to give her proper lines and proper scenes after the time. It, mate, it, it doesn't really serve the story in any great way. And frankly, when you've got you know, a bit of an arsenal at your disposal, I would imagine it's easier to create a diversion than that. Yeah. Maybe Scotty dancing? I don't know. Somebody else dancing? See, that would be, be honest, funny. That would be, one, that would be one of the classic scenes. But that would be a bit like at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy when Chris Black Pratt dances. Yeah. It's the same principle. Yeah. Make a twat of yourself. And look at you. It's a very um, Gene Roddenberry thing, I think. Okay. I think so. Um, you see. He would have gone do that, He's... and he would have gone, yes, sir. Yeah. No, just, just well, just his kind of, because like, there's the whole thing about when he was describing Beverly Crusher as walking like a stripper yeah. and oh. things like that, and kind of his, it was all, it always his job to make sure he checked out all the uniforms for the uh the alien girls in the original series and all this kind of thing. 
Yeah, and he would pitch stories saying, like, I wonder how the Yorombulans have sex and things like that. He did appear to have quite a salacious mind. And actually, when you go back and watch the original series, as shallow as this is going to sound, it's full of extraordinarily beautiful women compared to subsequent versions of Star Trek. It's mm. very heavy on, like, beautiful women. So basically, so, so basically Gene Rodney's a bit of a perv, is that what he's He's a bit of a perv, yes. I wouldn't speak ill of the dead, but yes, he's a filthy bastard. <laughs> filthy pervert. Well, there's a story about him. I mean, people would say that he, he would say some really odd things. You know, he would go up to people. There was one time he said something about Major Barrett having thrush and explained graphically why. And as and as dirty as my mind is, I don't feel the need to repeat that. Inappropriate. Inappropriate. Yes. You know, if I was still in my thirties, I would point out that what he said was he took her up the ass and then in the vagina, and he said you can go front to back, but you can't go back to front. And he went up and said this to some staffer, but of course I'm in my forties now, so I wouldn't say that. And I'll probably. <laughs> You're, you're, you're now a mature gentleman now, Dave. Mature gentleman, I am. not dirty mind like that. No, no, no. No, I wouldn't say that. But yeah, the stories are. And, and actually, for all the joking around, when I read it, my jaw nearly hit the floor. Because who fucking talks like that? Apart from me. Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, apart from Trump. Jesus. Well, you know what I mean? For all this talk yeah. of like a better future and all that, an awful lot of the time it was, it's let not. me talk about sex. It's actually perverted. Which, oh, yeah, absolutely. Perverted. <laughs> So yeah, they um they, they I'd like to apologize to listeners for that last section. <laughs> it was just it was this just not true, not true. We're gonna have to put a big eighteen certificate on this. No No, no, no. Like, we we wanna reach out to kids. <laughs> <laughs> not yeah, in that way. Why, that's why that's why <laughs> that's why we've got a young child in the background on Charlie's end of the game, so we can get that parrot demographic. <laughs> <laughs> Luke yeah, won't be able a, to listen until he's old enough, sorry. It's, it's a good thing I'm wearing headphones. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I, liked, I like how the Shuttle Cross was the Galileo. So that must be a nod to the I Galileo know. 7 episode. Yeah, it was, because the, the font on it was the same as well. Yes, I thought that, mm. that was a nice little nod. It was a really nice design as well. It's kind mm. of... It's very cool. Even though it was at the same time as the next generation, it still kind of felt like... At least that kind of stuff felt like a... Uh, oh, not very futuristic. Yeah, a different design, a direction, but still something the way you could see the evolution from the uh, uh, the, the TNG where the TNG shuttles ended up. No, I, I did like a lot of the design um, of this film as well, which is um, very nice to look at. Yeah. I don't like the lighting of it too much. I think there's, I certainly there are a bit scenes that look a bit garish. They actually were not just because of the three-breasted woman, but there, there's the odd scene that reminds me of Total Recall, which was obviously to to come the following year, just in its mm. colour scheme. There's a lot of, like, quite sleazy reds in it and stuff like that. It's, um... Yeah, it doesn't really give off the, the right vibe, does it? Obviously, but Charlie, it Charlie's right about the design of the shuttlecraft. Really liked it. Mm, definitely. But uh, Paradise City is meant to be that kind of, like, cantina, kind of, like, slum. I mean, like, it was always meant to be, um... Quite garish. Yeah, yeah, well, they, they, they said it was, like, originally conceived as, like, a place where, like, of, of peace with uh, no, no weapons, but they just... But they just plonked like all, all basically the the scum and villainy of of the universe on it. So it just became like <laughs> I have a scum and villainy. Yeah, it basically just kind of like as you'd expect. So it it, it would like look like something like a Total Recall, really, um, as as you expect. So basically, they get captured by 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 Psylocke. Um, this is after uh, Spot gives a horse a vodka nerve pinch in one yeah, of the, in, in one of the most oh, oh awkward sort of. It, it it's it's more of a case like. A guy comes up to him with a horse. He goes, "Oh, hang on." Touches there you him go. And <laughs> down he goes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's another scene that, I, that didn't really bode well with me. I mean, I'm I'm sure obviously there was a horse wrangler on set and everything was very safe. But anything towards any kind of animal, I'm still I just I'm not a fan of. But I'm, I'm sure everything was safe and fine. They wouldn't have shown it otherwise, and that's fine. But I just was like, I just went so I'm like, oh. And also, I know it's not a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, how they made that horse slide real. down was really cruel, wasn't it? Drugs. Well, no, it's, it's the way that it happened, and I was just like, ugh. But I'm just a bit, I'm a wimpy when it comes to anything like that, I'm afraid. But, um, yeah, you never got to horse, I was like, what? It, it, it is one of them things where you just think, oh, why? 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 Who thought this was a good idea? 
why a horse? No, why not the guy on the horse? Like, what? Well, it's just like, you know, well, we, we, you've seen him mind, uh, mind meld of a whale, why not Vulcan 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 <laughs> exactly, North? That's you true. Know. I'm yeah. like, nothing wrong with my melding of the whale, but they're gripping a horse. I mean, if this had so- carried on, we'd have ended up with him fucking melding with IKEA tables and fuck <laughs> those <laughs> I mean, they it was they were they were upping the stakes every stakes every week, weren't they? Yeah, table. I've just melded with a Ford Escort captain. <laughs> <laughs> Very upset about the state of its uh, spark plugs. Oh dear! <laughs> Cars yeah. are feelings too. <laughs> this seems to go on forever. Um, it's and, we, battle, isn't it? and at some point, we uh, when do we get to that scene where he has a go at Spock? Well, we, we oh, it's um, well, basically they. G- they get captured, and and they and they and um, Sarlacc does his thing with the other members of the crew that aren't like the original three, and and then they they go they go on the shuttle they they escape the Klingons, kind of by you know by sort of just basically driving straight in and like being really quick at it, and uh, and then and uh, and then Kirk has an opportunity to. Uh, to kind of get the upper hand on on Salak, but uh, Spock doesn't shoot him because he's like, oh no, I can't shoot my brother. So that's that's that that is that is that, is that, is that the scene you you uh, yeah you yeah. yeah yeah Shatner just suddenly goes Shatner. He goes Shatner. Uh, that scene's <laughs> awful. He's what? so bad in it, and I'm thinking, don't Spock, you watch? Why did you do it? Why? Watches? Why? <laughs> At no he point really did doesn't. you watch that and go. Yeah, but fuck that up a bit, didn't I? Yeah, whoops. But it's just like it's what like... you said in that uh, Rafa Khan episode. It's like, well, you know, we had to get Shatner to do like, all the yeah. all, all the time. But take. he's not going ma- to make himself do 50 takes, no. is he? And that's the problem. A bit of us is like, first line, perfect, right next. <laughs> yeah, it just, it blows my mind. It just blows my mind. And then they've got these pop-out chairs, and I genuinely looked at it twice to see if he was sat on the top of a toilet. <laughs> I thought it was like a pop-out toilet or something. Oh, I just thought he was dreadful in this. From this point. Yeah. It's almost like they shot it in order, which they may well have done, I don't know. And then uh, does Scotty break him out, and then it goes a little bit diehard for, for the next few minutes? <laughs> it's just the things they're wasting the runtime on. <laughs> or for the joke of backup in Morse code or whatever yeah. it was. And it's like, yeah. And he blew up part of the set from Die Another Day, the cardboard wall. Um, I just thought they just wasted time on some weird stuff. And they didn't back up anyway. So what was the point of all that? <laughs> it blew up in their faces two seconds later. It was kind of like a, a sign of the film, really, wasn't it? Um <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah. So basically, they, they escape and they essentially get captured again, which yeah, is, is kind of pointless. And then you have, to, and then you have the scene where Psylocke, um go, goes for each of them, tries does this whole like, let me feel your pain, let me share it with me. Um, and he kind of sways Bones over by showing him like his by showing us that Bones was a fucking murderer. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you. Killed his dad. He's a he's a he's a doctor. God damn it! In all honesty, I've got all the sympathy in the world for euthanasia, yeah. but I thought that was kind of skip. You, you know, I I really do. I'm not. It's not just lip service. I'm not thinking. Well, that suddenly makes him a bad man. But they skipped over it quite quickly. The because eth- obviously, surely that would raise ethical issues. We don't know if it's legal in that era. That, and I just think that was really something... near to the bone. With I was me. just I thinking, was... pick something else. That was very grim, and I was like, mm. what, "What rating was this film?" Uh, PG, probably. I think. Yeah, I, I PG, think it was a bit, yeah. bit near the bone. Well, not near the well, rain, well. <laughs> near the bone. Maybe, maybe very uncomfortable, but near the bone. <laughs> I, I didn't want to say that, but you know what I mean. It's a bit heavy, you know, heavy subject going. So, what would be a PG? Also, that's why they skimmed over it. But I was just that's another, honest, another, another scene ima- that made me very uneasy. I can't imagine five-year-olds were desperate to see this. <laughs> well, no, but it's just. Oh, can I go quite... and watch the big fella in the wig? <laughs> Uh, no, yeah. but you know what I mean. You know, it's, I was just very surprised. It felt tonally out of sync with the rest of the film. But anyway, that's my, my you know moaning and groaning. Yeah. No, I, I, I anyway, didn't, moving on. I, I, didn't, I didn't have that much of an issue with it anyway. But um, it was just like it was just like one of them things. Like okay, well that's mm. that's that's McCall. I mean, like Spock's was like uh, his well, birth. Yeah, he's 
Yeah. It's like, oh, his dad doesn't love him, and, and Spock's like, well, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> they picked, <laughs> they picked a, really good, a really good actor to play, obviously, what we young sorry at the time. Um, he has epic cheekbones. Really incredible. Yeah. That's that good <laughs> acting, cheekbones, is it? <laughs> and I was like, it, it really looks like... Good cheekbone work there. <laughs> <laughs> They really uh, picked the right actor for the role. I know. What and, a talented set of eyelashes as well. <laughs> and uh, I kind of like what that comes next because he, he goes to Kurt and Kurt basically refuses. He says he kind of makes a point saying, no, you know, um, the the pain is what makes me. I'm not going to fall for like this contract. Oh, and uh, he's fucking dreadful in this as well. The way he says but, he needs his pain. I need my pain. I need my pain. But I like I think so, th- things of Dave. I... I, I like the idea of it. I like the message. I like. I always liked doing that bit myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it's a matter of opinion. I mean, I've seen far worse William Shatner than that, but I just thought I just thought it was just the whole thing was a bit ill conceived. He he wants to hang on to some pain. We don't really know why. The whole concept of what they're trying to do in this film is like well, that's a particularly new concept to introduce to us anyway. Um, is there a better version of this without a writer's strike where perhaps they worked, you know, perhaps they could have presented it in a way that I wouldn't have had any issues? Possibly. I don't know. But certainly the way it's it's come out, I find this all a little bit clunky. But, I mean, there are things I do like in it as well because you've got um, just little design things. I like the old sort of uh, sailing ship kind of... Um, wheel that they've got there and things like that mm. but when they're when they're on the way to see god it very clunkily goes down to the sign that says where no man has gone before or no one has gone before yeah and it's just like yeah we get the theme we know you're going somewhere new um <laughs> did you like the fact that when like when uh, bone says like am i dreaming well <laughs> life is but a dream <laughs> <laughs> to tie it and all the, back to the row, other thing row, is chapter row 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 seriously yes. as well so it's like you know he, t- he takes his workplace very seriously but well, actually, it's don't mind his this. film though isn't it it's his film yeah, it's, so, yeah. um... and it's his vision as well and as I say he worked really hard to put it on screen so but uh, they go and meet meet um, God yeah and well, they, um, so that, like, just lets um, Kirk back command the ship as well because he's, like, he's like well you know why not <laughs> <laughs> I've just taken over your shit, but you might as well have it back. <laughs> but, 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 but it kind of, but it, it does kind of play from Kirk's kind of point of view. It's like, well, I'm here now. I might as well, you know, explore because that's what that's who I am. You know, um, he could have gone into the cantina and hired a freighter. <laughs> well, God's a busy man. Um, oh my God, so cheesy. Oh my God. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> So, but that had a when I saw him say that, God's a busy man. It's got a sing song quality to it. Literally and, how he and says all it. I could think of was, Here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, Yeah, it needed someone to like get him to do 15 takes until he went, God's a busy man. Yeah, you, yeah, you're right. That would have been like a played out a lot better. It would have, uh, if he just said it like a bit more drier. Yeah, <laughs> God's a busy man. man. God. <laughs> God, God's a busy man. Having said that, why, I'm, Spark? I'm why, ragging, why? <laughs> I'm, ragging, I'm ragging on him quite a bit, but it's really only two or three scenes. Yeah, he's I all mean, right for the most part. It's just we see some of the worst instincts of the actor in this film, where you would expect to, because he's directing himself. He doesn't have yeah. somebody impartial saying you might want to look at it doing it this way. And at the very least, uh, there is entertainment value for Shatner being bad as well. There is that element, so that does carry that like carries me through anyway. So I can kind of like laugh at you know Shatner a bit overreacting because it's just it's bad. But you go okay, fine. So yeah, they go down to God Planet, and uh, well named given who lives there. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's called uh, Shakari, isn't it? Mm, yes. And that and that was. Uh, Oh, and I, is, is that a fun fact? I was about to say that. I, I won't say it. Yeah, don't. Uh, it's a fun it's fact in the coming, fun fact. Yeah, it's uh, uh, They can't wait, they, they're listeners. <laughs> yeah. Oh, just like, you know, tentalise you there. Uh, You'll go quiet. You can hear the sound of hundreds of semis lifting around <laughs> the world. <laughs> I was like, 
as uh, as Roger Moore would say, I, I'll uh, wet the appetites. Um, <laughs> no, um, so yeah, they go down to God Planet and uh, they meet God essentially. God comes out from the ground, like many know. voices. Yeah, no, was it one voice, many faces? That was it. Yeah, and who know it? God's a big guy with a big beard. You don't say. <laughs> Who'd have thought? <laughs> Who'd have thought? Um, and he actually, it does, it does look like kind of a TV display. Yeah, it is. But just... apparently, th- this one of the things I read today was they they didn't go with ILM for a few reasons, and it wasn't just lack of choice. It was partly that ILM were overcommitted, so they were worried they'd get their D team, which is probably true. They would have. But apparently, ILM did do tests, and the tests that they got uh, the effects houses to do were their conception of God. And Half Bennett says that ILM did a particularly bad test. Oh, really? Mm, yeah, and it, it was they went with a lot of the rhetoric of uh, of the company that they went with in the end. It was based a lot on what they had to say and their plans. Unlike the motion picture, when when they hit trouble. They, they broke out the money and got people like John, John Dykstra in to sort it out. Mm-hmm. By this point, Charlie's right. Paramount don't want to spend the money. So they just said yes to all these shots that came in that weren't great. Well, Shatner wanted um, like Rock Monsters to come out at the end. Yeah. Uh, that, that was his thing. We, we described it as like, you know, like kind of devils like coming out, like sort of made a rock and... T- mm. Type, type thing and that um but they they just didn't have the budget by the end of it so he had to kind of just all right we'll have to stick with god face um god he face. takes responsibility for it quite professionally um i have to say but he does say whether it's a throwaway remark or he'd actually figured it out back in the day it needed another three million dollars and no one was giving it that yeah i find it hard to believe that ilm did should he work or not should he work but Mm. Well, anyway, ILM didn't. I'm talking about a test. Yeah, that's fine. Maybe they didn't want it. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. They were like, right, let's just do a half assed job, or maybe we won't get it because we're too busy doing other movies. Well, what yeah. films were they doing at the time? Well, Indiana Jones for a start. Ghostbusters um, 2. I don't know. I, I don't want to like. We know what was coming out that year, so you could guess what they worked on from the types of films. But you would have thought they did Ghostbusters 2, yeah. No, they did, yeah. I don't know if they were anything to do with the abyss either. That was probably good to be fair, but that was that year as well. Yeah, they did the uh, the yeah, CG so. in the abyss. Yes. So they go. Uh, they were very overcommitted. Yes, um, they were busy that year. I mean, the thing is, effects houses. Everybody works on everything anyway because it gets subcontracted. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but, but what you are looking at is the sort of quality control that ILM traditionally have held things to quite a high bar. Mm. And some of the effects houses, I mean, they were throwing out stuff and Paramount were going, yeah, all right. And it looks awful, some of it. It really does. And it does affect my feelings about the film because it has to go down as a black mark against the film. But at the same time, I do feel a bit sorry for them. It really kind of takes you, it's kind of beyond, well, beyond their control, but it takes you out of the film as well if you happen to, if you notice, oh, the effects are quite poor, especially for, for that time. It's, well. Especially since they use stock footage from previous films as well, so it flips between the Decent. good set, the yeah. good shots, well, there we are. and then these awful shots. Yeah, yeah, it's quite jarring, isn't it? When you can't notice the, the dipping quality of the two, and you think, "Oh, okay." Yeah, it's like we see a Klingon ship cloak at one point, I think, and that's that's stock footage. They've used mm. that before. They use that previously. Yeah, you, I'm, you see I'm that a lot through this series, but. Yeah, he's right. The stuff that was made, there were a couple of times where you'd see the Enterprise and it just it just looked like a still. Yeah. Um, and there might be minimal movement anyway if it wasn't a still, but somehow you can tell. Um, yeah, so, like yeah, the when, end result's not great. when the, um, the Enterprise goes and, goes and warp just before it gets hit by a, a Klingon missile, it, it, it does look very much... It, it doesn't look right, and I, and I don't know what it is, because you think, well, how else would it look? But it just looks a little bit like... It looks, as, as Dave said, it looks like a still, dude, and just, like, sort of just pushed it forward with wavy lines, you know. Um, <laughs> Somebody moved it the other yeah. way. Well, yeah, kind of. It, it looks kind of very much like... Whoop. Um, so... <laughs> so they, they find God, and, and God all of a sudden you goes, oh, 
Um, I'd like I'd, I'd like the Enterprise. I'd I'd I'd, <laughs> I'd, 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 I'd like to travel in the star in the starship. And um, it looks like excuse me, what do you need with the starship? Yeah, it it essentially is my um, second favorite Kirk moment. <laughs> I, I, I laughed out loud. I was like, he was like, oh, excuse me. <laughs> I was like, what? Do you mean in total, Chris? What? Well, what? Well, like my second favorite. When you say it's your second favorite, is your second favorite full stop for Kirk? I I would say so. Yeah. What's your first? Oh, it's um, Khan. It's Rafa Khan when he eats the apple. You know. Hmm. I don't like to lose. Yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. That's that, a Kirk moment. That has to be number one. But um... what I do like about it is that he struggles to get that interjection in. Like everyone's got carried away with it's God. We must do whatever they say. Yeah. And it's this little objection that no one else has thought of. Yeah. And he's like, "Excuse me, hang on a minute." <laughs> Excuse, Excuse me. me. <laughs> and, that, and that's I, and that's I what like. I like because it's Kirk with the balls, just going like, "Um, hang on, yeah. I've just got like." Hold on a minute. <laughs> I've just got, I've just got a question, you know, and then, then he gets like, you know, asked like, who is this creature? He's like, what? Don't you know? Aren't like, you guard? Just, just, just question, you know, just constantly like sort of, you know, get, like sort of just question like sort of the unspeak, you know, where everyone just goes along with like, oh my God, it's God, you know, you know, don't ask God for, ID, for, for his ID, like Bowen says, but you know, Kirk will, because he's Kirk, you know, he's, you know, he's. He's the guy with the balls. But we don't know how big they are. Clearly that big. We haven't measured them. No. Yet, so <laughs> we don't expect them to be a ton each. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get on it as soon as we find out that footage of uh, Ted Danson falling off his chair. Yeah. <laughs> Frankly, there must be, if he's got testicles that weigh a ton each, it, there must be footage of a chair collapsing under Shatner. <laughs> I like my own chair. I'm old chair, I bet you did. <laughs> supported your bollocks better because that chair is quite small we're never going to get him on the show now oh dear yeah. <laughs> still I may, anyway. have turned, I may have turned 40 this week but only Chris has gone double denim <laughs> <laughs> just while I'm thinking about the shat wearing jeans <laughs> I love the double denim going on yeah. Chris went double denim the other day <laughs> I, I did. I left the house and I sort of I you know, thought I grabbed a jacket which is like a denim jacket. And I didn't even realise I was wearing actual the the jeans that were the exact same colour material. Oh, no. as, yeah. Did you go home and change, or did you like no, this is fine? No, 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 he, went, it, it, no he went and made a video to Green Door. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, it, no. By the time I realised it, it, it was it was too late. Too late. I, I was already like. This I must see. The interview. Yeah. Is, it, is, it, is this anywhere online? Let me see. <laughs> no, why would it be online? Yeah. Know. So, uh, yeah. So that's my second favourite Kurt moment. Uh, what, what do you guys think? <laughs> when he wore double denim. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll aim to wear triple denim next time round. <laughs> wear a denim shirt. Just wallpaper yourself in <laughs> denim. So what do you guys make of that Kurt questioning God? I think it's hilarious. Um, just c- completely unrelated reasons. There's a sort of running joke um, between myself and my group of friends. And that's just why I find it funny. Um, you know, it's just, it's only Kurt could do that. So he's sort of the only person who really could say, like, face to face with God and go, hold on, what are you trying to do? And it's just completely unbelievable. Um, and I sort of, it's really sort of made me laugh out loud. I was like, what? <laughs> But so you didn't buy it? You were like, oh, no. okay, all right. No, okay, just just because obviously this is a running joke, <laughs> and it just took me out of the moment a little bit. Fair enough. But um, it's it's all the, the effects are quite poor, and that took me out of the film really, to be honest. So I was lost by this moment. Well, not lost, but not feeling it, shall we say? There's a worst effect coming up actually, right off the back of this. But Charlie, what do you think? The eyes upping. Oh, I, I really like it. It's a typical Kirk moment, but it's very much a part of the way the film kind of sets up Kirk as um, the, the kind of ultimate hero in the film and uh, kind of he's the one that's always kind of pushing everything against Cyborg and uh, I mean the, I, I just, it just seems like a, despite that a, a good Kirk moment and it's it's funny as well especially um, um, McCoy's line as well 
about you don't ask the Almighty for his ID. Oh, he's horrified. He's like, oh, fucking hell, what are you doing? <laughs> but the, the, the bad effect I was referring to is where Kirk is, picked, is beamed onto the Klingon ship after this. Oh, right, so... Because that, that Klingon ship looks like it's probably a two-inch miniature or something. <laughs> yeah, that's, quite actually, that's a bit unfair, because there's quite a lot of detail in it. But the way it's all sort of comped together doesn't quite look right to me. It was probably used from another film. It's probably just like got it from an older film and just like plonked it there, really. They yeah, could have, they, 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 they could have done that. So, yeah, so basically, yeah, Kurt gets chased by it and... Um, not by, by Godface... And the Klingon ship. Um, yeah, good face. Yeah, um, this this is after uh, Silak uh, sacrifices himself. God, yeah. Shares his pain with uh, with God. Um, Share your pain with God. <laughs> Pour a couple of whiskeys. <laughs> Put on I, some I, Barry Manilow. I, 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 I do love the fact that when he went like you know I don't have a pain. He's like and God's like pain. Hmm? What what are you doing? <laughs> it's kind of like this. This this weird, weird kind of confused state, um, and yeah, so they uh, the Enterprise manages to teleport McCoy and Spock, and Spock convinces the Klingon captain to kind of not kill Kirk, in fact save him, um, and they and they, and uh, Kirk boards the Klingon ship, and I, I've always kind of. Wonder what the point of this is like. Oh, and let me introduce to our new gunner. And there's Spock there. I thought turning around in his villain chair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I was thought, well, what was the point in that? I mean, why do we need to know that it was Spock who fired the shot? You know, I, 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 it doesn't really matter. It's like, well, all right, they found him something to do. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, it's I, completely consequential. Because he's not alone. Is that? <laughs> That's why. What? Because he's not alone. Yeah. Because right. Spock is there to, to save him and tell them out. Yeah, he's basically right. a brother from another mother. But yeah, there's like, oh, please, not in front of the Klingons. <laughs> 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 Which is hilarious. So, um, yeah, and then the film kind of wraps up. I mean, you have uh, um, ev- everyone kind of like celebrating, everyone's happy, you know. Um, Sp- uh, Spock, up, Spock McCoy and, uh, and Kirk have, have a... Have a little speech. Kirk says something like, "You know, the message that he always wanted to say in the whole film, which was, you know, God, God's not out there. He's, oh, he's, he's in here." I hate yeah, that. that is that is terrible. That's really bad. I, 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 cool. I watched some of the commentary and, and like um, Shatner fought to have that line in there. Yeah, well done, William. Because um, that because because of him, that was the whole message he wanted to give. That God is in our hearts. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. And that's I, think I'm go- I think I'm going to leave that silence in, to be honest with you. <laughs> it says more than any of our sober analysis. And, and then he, and, and, and then there's the extra added bit of like, you know, you know, I, I, I thought um, that this uh, life, life on a starship was uh, not not firing. Oh, oh I'm, I've cut that up now. I know what, what does he say? Something about I family. I thought you said men like us don't have families. That's it. Because that's, that's what he says. When, that's what he says. Um, I lost a brother once. I was glad I got him back. Yeah. yeah he means moment. Spock, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's quite a touching moment. Oh yeah, I think it it's a lovely moment. Oh, it is a lovely moment. I'm, is, I'm only, I'm only mocking the fact that, like, I wonder if there's people who watched it who went, "I don't get it." <laughs> <laughs> but there's also you miss the uh, the, the bit where. Um, you have Sulu and uh, and Chekhov following the uh, the Klingon. Um, oh yeah, going that she has nice muscles. And get, she has wonderful muscles, <laughs> and the, it gets actually to the point where Sulu has to physically push Chekhov away from following her to uh, to, uh, to <laughs> the for, darkened room. <laughs> commander, yes. <laughs> That's a bit weird. They said obviously they started following her, and then all of a sudden they're like, "Oh, detour!" And it's like, "What the hell?" Yeah, but, it's just like you, to be you, honest, you, I'm surprised um, Chekhov's not fucking blind. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, 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 you know, he emerges from this film vaguely unscathed, so mm. that's quite good. Yeah, it doesn't even fall off a chair. No, he doesn't. <laughs> so he's fully seated most of the time. Yeah, no, because I mean, what was it? The first one he got burnt, didn't he? Yeah, and then he had the ear slugs. The second one he had the ear slugs. I can't remember anything in the third. So in the fourth, he got severe brain trauma. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this yeah, one's alright, so that's good. Yeah, this one is okay. I wonder what happens in the next film. I, d- I don't know, but he has my favourite line, though, in the in next film. He does. <laughs> oh, what, the, um, is the shoes? No, 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 it'll be Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. Which uh, Michelle Nichols refused to say. Yeah. Thank God, because he, he, del- he, he says it so fucking dry. Like, so sarcastic. It's brilliant. Um, so, yeah, and uh, that's the final frontier with their back on Yosemite singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat. And, yeah, uh, just, just the credits. most random fucking thing in the world, but all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, credits. Great. <laughs> Starring Edward Snowden. <laughs> and Michelle Shatner. <laughs> Melanie Shatner, not Michelle Shatner. His daughter was a yeoman. How about that? A little family. Um... So anyway. Yay. Star Trek V. <laughs> <laughs> what do we think of Star Trek V? Well, hmm. <laughs> I like it, but I understand why others don't. Uh, it, for me, it's all about moments uh, rather than the film as itself and ideas. I, I kind of like it for that, but um, you know, it's it's not great, but I'll happily watch it. I'm bored by it more than anything else, um, and the bits I like have no real... No, uh, yes, you can say a drop line here or a drop line there in the themes, but broadly speaking, certainly plot-wise, there, there's very little of relevance in most of the scenes I like. Um, we're starting to see the sort of um, de-evolution, if you like, of um, Shatner as an actor. I, but I think it's it will be near the bottom. It will be fighting to stay off bottom slot in, in mine, with, down there with like Into Darkness and stuff, because I'm largely bored. But having said that, it's easy to think it's a film without merit, and it isn't. It's actually... It's actually pretty competently directed for the most part. Um, and there's some lovely scenes in it. But that's that's about as far as I can go with it. I didn't have a I great get, time with it. I, I guess it's the difference between being bored or shouting irately at the TV or the cinema screen. No, I'm never angry with it. I'm just bored by it. With the, no, I was thinking of more of Into Darkness. Mm. Yeah. Um, They're very different experiences that I'll have to balance when we rank. I'm, I'm scared to death of watching it. Of of into darkness. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, it's not very good. It was so it was so dreadful the first time. But there's a little part of me that thinks, what if I like it? <laughs> oh no. Yeah, that will be all um, your legendary yeah. street cred gone. <laughs> legendary street cred. What the man what is if, about to say? It... I really liked the final frontier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but that's got that's got more of a two fingers up at the system. Kind of, yeah. kind oh, of yeah. Fuck yeah. you! I like I'm, I'm I'm the the odd odd numbered Star Trek uh, fan. I no, I I like the film. I obviously it has serious problems in a lot of ways, um, but I, I really like the character stuff in it, um, and I love the music. The music's just amazing, and that's kind of the music and and. The some of the way that Shatner, um, some of the things that Shatner does with the camera, and it's some of it just looks really, really nice. Um, and uh, and together with the music, it, it makes for a decent experience for me. Um, and again, there's nostalgia playing a huge part as well because I still remember seeing when the day I went to see this at the cinema. Oh, wow. um, but uh, yeah, no, it's 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 not good, but I like it. I don't actually know. <laughs> 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 Indecisive um, comment. <laughs> Indecisive comments. Um, okay, I'm going to say this. Um, oh, is he alright? Yeah, he's okay. Yeah. Oh, bless him. That was me two weeks ago. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> what found really Charlie's nice. lap? <laughs> no. <laughs> In... I didn't. I didn't know that. <laughs> don't tell anybody. No parts of this film I like. Parts of this I don't like. Yeah, I think there's just the, the poor visuals um, and some of the cheesy lines do take it out, take me out of it, unfortunately. Um, when we come to the ultimate rankings, I think this will probably be quite low on the scale. Um, but we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I've got to say on it, really. So it made a large impression on you, Becca. <laughs> really, really. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 don't, something to say. Yeah. I, I don't really know. I, I, don't, I don't hate it, but I, I don't think it's amazing either i mean yeah the charlie's first... got a point there because i don't think you'll have nothing you won't be struggling for something to say about into darkness you know yeah. it, it does demand stronger emotions 
Yeah. There's one. There's one really well, main draw. Prince yeah. Darkness, of course. But that's just that's just me. But, <laughs> well, I don't remember any tits in it. <laughs> well, no, obviously, having seen Khan, I think that's I'll be able to watch Into Darkness, and that'll have a whole new bearing on it. And I think I'll come away because I was thinking, oh yeah, it's amazing. Rah, rah, rah. Um, but now I'm sort of like, mm, really? So I think I'm probably going to be more harsh on it. I think I think we'll for, for me, the major the the, the major uh, disappointment of uh, Into Darkness is just how wrong they got the character of Khan. You know, it's just like that is. That it's just like, yeah, have you even seen Rafa Khan kind of, kind of level? It's like, mm. well, basic, basic storytelling logic is missing. Yeah, it was, it, was, yeah. it was the fact that they tried to combine Space Seed and Khan into the same thing, it didn't really happen. Whereas Khan worked because it was 20 odd years yeah. after Space Seed, yeah, mm. exactly. I mean, it, it, it would have been triple. it would have been something if they just sort of thought, okay, well, how about we try and remake Space Seed rather than trying to like cram in, um, Rafa Khan in there as well. Um, but it, again, it's like it's just too obvious. Why don't you just try and do something else instead? Why don't Why do you have to have remake Rafa Khan? You know, but we'll, we'll... yeah, that that would be a a whole new experience for us, and uh, possibly the most yeah. entertaining episode of this. Uh... But but it is it is at least a debate between uh, as we stand at the moment. I know I've got the next generation films to do and all the rest of it. At yes. the moment, though, it's going to be fighting out the bottom spot with tonight's film for me. And it is competitive. It is in as much as, yes, I've got more um, nostalgia and interest in the original casting of this crew, you know, and there are things I like in the interplay here. But like I say, I was largely bored. It does look a bit cheap and nasty. Into Darkness, it's almost like they threw everything at it, but it's just, but it does, it does get stronger yes. emotions out of me, but I'm never bored. So I'm, I'm going to, yeah, there's a lot to think about there. But I think it's going to be competitive between those two because they're the two films that are really sloppy. And now, having got a bit more of an appreciation for the motion picture than I had before, it stands out as the one shocker we've seen so far. Three wasn't great, but it was all right. And it finished off a storyline we cared about or took us further on in a storyline we cared about. This film, you can totally skip. If you know if you like it, great, but you don't need to see this, really. No, it's completely no. irrelevant. Whereas next week's, I think, is is really, I think, is great, and you really do need to see it. I'm looking forward to next week. Mm, me too. That said, I'm sure there's some interesting trivia about the making of this film and other facets. Um, yes, we have some fun facts. Um, fun um, fact: yeah. recasting. Sunshine. Okay, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, originally the nearest sexy now. We've got we've got listeners wilting as we say. I I I couldn't help notice you had fun facts. Share it with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've you can feel your one, pain. <laughs> fun fact. <laughs> so I force that upon you, Charlie. I thought you, you can take the fun facts rain this week. No, that's okay. Um, right. So the uh, yeah, like you mentioned, Sean Connery. Um, he was supposedly to uh, to be Cyborg, um, but for whatever reason, wasn't. But the planet they go to, Shakari, was apparently named after him. So kind of like Sean Connery, Shakari, Shakari. Um, I find that completely basically. amazing. It's mind blowing. Yeah, um, I don't know what Sean Connery thinks about it. Um, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to be yeah, Charlie, so... I don't think even Sean Connery cares. Uh, no, yeah. I don't think he bothers with it anymore. Yeah. To be honest, is it? Oh, that's nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. And at the uh, couple of cameos in the film, so um, you had uh, David Warner as um, the English English Earth Terran ambassador, who is in the next film in a completely different role, oh. um, and uh, is also, also appeared in Next Generation, yeah, Chain of Command. Yes. Um, and you had. The guy at the beginning, Bob, the staff, the officer who gives Kirk his 
D, his, uh, his mission was producer Harv Bennett. And uh, you had Melanie Shatner, who is one of William Shatner's daughters, but- as the yeoman who was dealing with him when he is... Um, electronic captain's log thing was malfunctioning um his other daughter mel um sorry elizabeth um wrote a book at the same time um just kind of chronicling the uh, the shooting and her father's kind of thoughts on making the film as also mentioned before this thing this film shares a few things with star trek and the next generation which at this point had been on for two years um, a lot of the sets were redressed. <laughs> lots of corridors. One or two weren't like though. <laughs> yeah. The corridor, corridor shot is isn't redressed in one shot. It's were, literally um, the next generation corridor. Belong to the Enterprise D, and yeah. uh, the set itself was because of the previous one that had been damaged um, for some reason. Obviously, also the the main theme uh, of the film, the motion picture theme, is also the main theme of the Next Generation. And uh, there's one scene which we haven't mentioned, uh, maybe just because it is not a brilliant scene, um, of the uh, the scene where Spock and his rocket boots take Dr. McCoy and Captain Kirk up the... Oh, uh, yeah. Whatever, whatever shaft Up the there canyon. Is. Up. <laughs> oh, never mind. Good coming here. That um, a cameo, that's staying in. That was a good euphemism there. Um, <laughs> that was amazing. Go, when no man has gone did before. Did you ever think of like Charlie and Chocolate Factory of that bit? Oh dear, there's, yeah. no, there's no need for anal <laughs> references, Chris. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's escalated quickly. Um, yeah, but, you, but, you know, you know a bit of me with a bit of the bubbles and they're kind of floating, you can't like... Yeah. yeah. Just, that, that's where I'm going. Oh. Yeah. Can I um, come on the show next week, please? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, can you um, say something more about crevices or something? <laughs> but, um, um, until he's 18. Well, that, that, that scene was misguided for various reasons. One reason is that the, you can see the deck numbers on the side as they go up, and it oh, goes yeah. up to deck 78 when the Enterprise itself only has 23 decks. Oh, and apparently the production uh, designer, Herman Zimmerman, um, pointed this out to Shatner, and he just said, I don't care. <laughs> and there are my fun facts. What I, lo- what I love about it, so you can kind of tell where, like, where the uh, the the strap would be, where like lifts them up, and that little uh, black bar right in the centre where Spock stands. And there's the big groove. In yeah. The, in the side of the wall. Yeah. And it goes up. Yeah, it's really obvious. That's fun, folks. Hey! <laughs> Do that again as louder, and I'll just splice it. In. Just her yelling. It's fun. <laughs> No, just just just, just put it on a really ridiculous volume. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it now for laughing so much. Uh, That's fun, folks. Yay! <laughs> All the intonations in completely the wrong place. Love it. <laughs> That's so, fun, folks. So, what's next week? Uh, wow. Oh, my face hurts. I'll try to be more on the ball next week because I didn't have something horrible looming after me. Yeah, but next, next next week is is is. Uh, yeah, yeah, next week is. If you don't, good. It, I think you'll enjoy it. It's proper good. Though. There are a couple of issues with it. It's not understood. It's really good. It really is. And I think you might have some interesting facts when you start looking looking into that film. I I I, I think the reason why it's so good, it's got a certain actor that David loves. Christian Slater elevates the material. <laughs> oh my life, I cannot wait for this To one. be honest, if I had to send someone to disturb George to K in bed, <laughs> oh. I'd probably Oh my. <laughs> I suppose that's one thing to say about The Final Frontier, is it's the last time uh, you see in Star Trek Sulu as the uh, Helmsman. Helmsman of the Enterprise. So was this always intended to be the final film? Because it's called The Final Frontier. No. No. All right. Just, I, just... I, I always figured, I always figured because of the title, they might have been at that time, the inclinations like, oh, let's call it a day here. It, it nearly was because of how badly this film did. But I think All that right. more means the kind of the, uh, um, God. the kind of barrier yeah, God, and things yeah. like that. And the, yeah, the great barrier and things like that. Yeah. And... And, admitting the, you, and admitting you can get across the galaxy in a couple of days now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting the way this they talk about quadrants in the original films 
Mm. and stuff versus the next generation things. Yeah. Because obviously you've got Voyager and the Delta Quadrant and you've got the um, the Gendama Quadrant and things yeah. like that, um, where there's a bit in this film where it says Klingon bird of prey in this quadrant or something like that. Yeah, where it's what they probably meant very... sector. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So that's a bit confusing. But um, I think, you know, sector, the fourth Daniel Craig Bond film. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely not as last if you you know listen to what people what the what news is saying isn't it the pint, 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 pint they're waiting um for him to finish <laughs> <Blimey. Yeah. laughs> no, i'm well, surprised i'm surprised he let them watch they're waiting for the uh se- they're waiting for the spectre writers to finish kindergarten <laughs> They're building quite the sandcastle. Let them finish. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, not for nothing, you could find me at the Pasty Kid 1976 on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at Cinematronics on Twitter, uh, where you can find this uh, uh, lovely podcast, as well as many of us, on uh, my website, uh, cinematronicsco.uk. You can find me at Films on Wax on Twitter, um, and uh, you can go to the website, which is filmsonwax.thedigitalfix.com. If you want to, you can find me at RV Movies, but you can also find us at Expect Us to Talk on Facebook.com slash Expect Us to Talk. And you can also find us on YouTube. Um, and you can send us an email, Expect Us to Talk at gmail.com. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our more mature outlook now we've reached a new decade in this show. Um, <laughs> ne- look out next week as we examine some Cold War themes. Which means Becca! You expected to talk, we'll return with Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country.